Uh, I will present how we address some uh, digital preservation issues uh, regarding digital rights. This presentation is a demonstration and uh, it will be to show how we validated the DRM key component and the digital rights ontology on two contemporary arts test beds, namely on uh, examples from INA and from SCIENT. There will be two scenarios. Uh, one will be an ingestion scenario about the creation of provenance data objects and uh, the second one will be a preservation scenario about the update of provenance PDI, uh, in particular of rights, if there is a change in law. So to introduce the problem, um, almost every archive must deal with, uh, must care about rights because many kinds of uh, content that they hold have property rights on them. So there is, for instance, copyright on literary, artistic and scientific works. Uh, there are neighboring rights on performances, databases and software programs. And there is industrial property right on scientific inventions, discoveries, trademarks and industrial design. So these rights uh, impose limitations uh, to the actions taken by people, bo both by the curator uh, as by the end user. This means that a preservation institution uh, must consider rights and uh, bring itself and uh, the, poten the potential consumer in the condition to be able to exploit uh, lawfully the materials also in the future. So coming to the first scenario, uh, first of all, consider that in order to maintain uh, updated and co uh, consistent uh, the rights information, it is not enough to just uh, store and preserve the rights themselves, but you need also to capture properly and to preserve all those provenance events that originated the rights. Because if something changes, as I will show in the second scenario, then one must uh, reconstruct the rights, starting from all the creation history. So to that purpose, the, uh, a tool was developed uh, specifically for the artistic uh, community. Uh, which was uh, shown also in the video from INA and it is about, uh, it allows to create in a very user-friendly way uh, provenance PDI. So we'll see, uh, you will see that uh, the output of one session will be two uh, objects. One will be a provenance data object that contains the life cycle and the other will, be, uh, will uh, contain the description of intellectual property rights. I'm going to show you now this tool. This is, uh, it is called Cyclops and it is for the documentation of artistic works. So it allows to build graphically the life cycle of, uh, of works. If I open, for instance, an existing uh, documentation, Uh, this, is, uh, this is about uh, the work uh, Spaces of Mind. This is an acousmatic music piece that comes from, uh, from INA GRM. And this graph says that uh, Daniel Teruggi was the author. Uh, it describes the whole creation process, uh, which were uh, the intermediate results, which resources were used, and also information like about the, the public performances and associated dates and places. So the, the user can compose such a graph by using uh, a set of predefined uh, entities and relationships from the menu on the top. So from uh, the point of view of, uh, uh, in terms of OAI, yes, this documentation represents provenance. And uh, the benefit of this tool is that it uh, automatically uh, translates this description 
into a suitable uh, formalism to be uh, stored and preserved along with the work. And in Caspar, we choose the Sidoc as a representation, uh, as representation language for provenance. In fact, if I export this, uh, this documentation, um, I uh, obtain an, uh, an RTF file which contains instances of the Sidoc ontology. So I can uh, save, save this file on my laptop and can use it later uh, as provenance data object, for instance, to use it with uh, multi, uh, Musti Caspar to, uh, to upload it uh, in one tool, for instance. Uh, beside, uh, Cyclops is also uh, integrated with the DRM key component. So if I, for instance, uh, click on update DRM information, then uh, uh, this tool sends to the DRM component some of the information that are uh, useful to uh, derive rights. So it sends, for instance, the title and the type of the work, uh, which are the constituent parts of the work, uh, who contributed in which way, uh, date and place of uh, the first public manifestation. And from that, the DRM uh, derives all the detail, um, details about uh, intellectual property rights. So uh, who owns the rights, what type of right it is, uh, the expiration date, the country of validity. Once the DRM has derived the rights, uh, it, sends back, it sends back to the tool uh, this information uh, serialized as RDF uh, data. Mm. And in particular, it contains uh, instances of the rights ontology. I can again save this uh, file on my laptop. And, uh, and can use it later to preserve it along with the work uh, itself. Now some, some words about the rights ontology. Uh, this is a domain ontology that we developed in CASPAR and it contains uh, entities and relationships that are able to describe all the aspects that are some, somehow relevant to evaluate rights. So not only the, the, the rights and their attributes, but also validity in time and space, laws and agreements, uh, people, actions, licenses, and constraints and conditions on actions. Uh, one important thing to think to say is that uh, this ontology is harmonized with CIDOC and with FRBR OO. Uh, as a consequence, the two uh, data objects that uh, I show uh, before are integrated. In fact, if I, if I use an RDF visualization tool and open first uh, the rights file, you see there are a lot of uh, uh, instances. It is a quite complex file because there are a lot of rights on the various uh, constituent parts. There are uh, all the people. And uh, if I now include also the creation history, the life cycle that was first exported by uh, Cyclops, then you can identify uh, the above part is um, contains the rights, the part uh, ab uh, below uh, contains the creation history, and you can see that they are connected. This means uh, that it is possible to query by navigating from one part to the other. And this is useful if you want, for instance, to implement uh, uh, search and retrieval that is based on provenance, where you can include both uh, rights information and creation history. 
So this was uh, to show how we deal with ingestion of rights, that we not only uh, preserve the rights, but also the creation history, that we use the rights ontology and CIDOC as representation languages, and, uh, that, uh, and that we use provenance data also as the descriptive information in the sense that uh, um, we, we use it to implement search and retrieval. Okay, now coming to the second scenario. Uh, this is a preservation scenario and it is an accelerated uh, lifetime test where the goal uh, is that we want to demonstrate that the system withstands uh, changes in law. So we suppose, for instance, that uh, there is an amendment to the copyright law which extends uh, the definition of artistic performer to include not only uh, traditional instrument players but also musical assistants uh, who project sound files during an acousmatic uh, music piece. Uh, in that case, uh, we would have more right holders on Spaces of Mind, which is an acousmatic music piece. Uh, in this scenario, uh, the actor would be a DRM preservation expert who would use uh, the Caspar web desk, desktop to access uh, some of the Caspar key, key components. Uh, in this scenario, there are five components that are involved. First, there is the orchestration manager who would be used to uh, send notifications about uh, the need of intervention. Uh, then the finding aids would be used uh, to retrieve uh, all the affected AI AIPs, all those works, all those uh, acousmatic works which have new rights on them. Then the DRM would be used to uh, update the rights derivation rules and to um, re re rebuild, um, derive again the rights. And finally, the packaging and the PDS uh, would be used to substitute uh, the old provenance with, uh, with the new updated one. So I'm showing now the Caspar web desktop. and I'm choosing uh, the user interface of the digital rights uh, management component. You see there, are, there is, for instance, the, the feature, the, a part of the API, which allows to register um, the creation history, some part of the creation history. And this is, in fact, the part that was used by Cyclops to, uh, to register uh, the life cycle. In fact, if I go on the creative activity part, you will see that there are some activities that have been uh, registered and that are related to uh, spaces of mind, these three, four. Um, so, um, coming to, to the scenario, if, um, if I go on uh, to check the rights, and I choose spaces of mind. Then I find a lot of, uh, of specialized types of rights who are all associated to Daniel Terruggi, but uh, I find no one that are associated to the performer. Uh, so if there would be such a change in law, then the, uh, the, the DRM preservation expert would have to go on the administration menu and he would have to uh, update the categorization of the activity of performing um, sound projection. So he would change, modify the classification and after afterwards he would um, he, he could export again the derived rights. If I check, faces of mind and all, then I will find some new uh, rights associated to the performer, to the sound performer. 
there are some, uh, these are related rights, not uh, auto rights, and there are some moral rights, which have no expiration date, and some economic right, rights, which expire in the year uh, 2170. This was, um, this was just one example of a change in law, but uh, there are others. Um, to be concrete, um, the European Parliament just voted in April for the extension of sound performers' rights and extended them uh, from 50 to 70 years post-mortem. Uh, this has still to be approved by the European Council, but if it will, then uh, all EU states will have two years' time to transpose this uh, directive into their own national law. And in such a case, uh, there would presumably be a point in time where some countries have already implemented the law. Let us suppose uh, that France is among them and some other uh, countries would not yet have uh, trans uh, transposed this uh, directive. And let us assume that uh, the Czech Rep Republic has not yet. Uh, so the, the objective in this, uh, in this scenario is that the, that the rights on the various works are interpreted correctly, taking into consideration the, the discrepancies uh, in the various countries that are introduced by this changing law. So to, to do the comparison, I uploaded uh, previously uh, the, the work Golem, in, in the DRM component, and this uh, work is a, a dance and technological art performance uh, which comes from the C, uh, science testbed. And uh, it is located, located in the Czech Republic. From the point of view of the rights, this is a quite complex uh, work because there are a lot of constituent parts. There is uh, sound, there are lights, uh, there is uh, 3D rendering, the choreography, the dance performance, uh, recording production, and the work ideation. So there are, uh, the DRM derives quite a, a big amount of rights associated to the various people. Uh, but if we focus now only on, uh, on, on the person uh, Luca, who is uh, the person that was in, char in charge of all the sound, then we find uh, that, uh, yes, he has uh, rights uh, um, related to the creation of the audio patch. Then uh, he also uh, did the sound control during the performance, and he did the, the audio recording. So. Uh, here we find all the rights associated to these uh, contributions and the expiration date of the economic rights is here the year uh, 2150. If you remember in the previous example it was uh, 2170. Although uh, the two uh, people, the two mm, actors have the same um, the same example that date registered. In fact, if I go on contributors, uh, I find here the French performer who has the same expiration date, like the same uh, example that date, like the Czech performer. So this was just to uh, highlight, to show that uh, if an archive decides to deal with rights, then it must, it must be able to, um, to handle the, the changing validity of rights in uh, time and in space. So to conclude, uh, some uh, words about uh, validation. Well, we have uh, almost come to the end of the project and we have now to uh, evaluate the results of our work. So what we can say about uh, the digital rights ontology is that we uh, checked its suitability to represent rights 
and in particular we did this on against uh, real examples from INA and from SCIENT. Uh, we did a quite good jo job in validating the, the, rep the representation of intellectual property rights but we did not validate uh, the capability, the, the suitability of uh, representing licensed permissions, although this is a part that is uh, included in the rights ontology. Then we demonstrated the interoperability of the ontology with other standard or well-known ontologies like CIDOC and FRBR. And we uh, obtained a, uh, mainly positive feedback from the reviewers on the paper that was uh, submitted and accepted at ACDL. And this paper speaks about how uh, the digital rights ontology was used to describe and to preserve the rights. Then we have tested the capability of a, a Casper archive to handle changes of rights, in particular by withstanding changes in law and considering that there are multiple legal frameworks. And finally, we can also say that we contributed to the state of the art in digital preservation uh, as the proposal that we submitted uh, to the OAIS uh, to include a new um, PDI section, in particular the access rights, uh, was accepted. Uh, if you are interested in having more information, you can find it on uh, these websites. There is uh, the source code and the documentation of the DRM key component, as well as of all the other key components. Then there is the rights ontology uh, with uh, the associated uh, documentation. You can find also uh, the Cyclops prototype online. And if you have uh, uh, particular questions, you can just uh, send us an email. Uh, some words about uh, validation. Uh, well, we ha have almost arrived to the end of the project and we have now to evaluate the results of our work. So what we can say about the digital rights ontology is that we have checked its suitability to represent rights and in par particular uh, against real examples from INA and from SCIENT. In this uh, presentation we have seen uh, the validation of uh, representing intellectual property rights. Uh, we have not shown the, the representation of licensed permissions, although the rights ontology includes also this part. Thank you very much for your attention.